moving up to Maine next week, and every year I'd like to build a little project while I'm up there, something that can be used around my in-laws place up there. And uh, this year I decided to build a dock chair. This design has been around for a while. It's this interlocking thing that comes together, breaks apart into two parts that can be stored easily flat, but then it interlocks and kind of locks together. And really, it's just a couple of legs held together by slats screwed in place. A really simple construction, but a lot of fun challenges with all the curves in the design. So after looking around the web for a bit for a pattern for these curved sides, I just decided to go ahead and mock up my own in SketchUp. And this is actually pretty easy to do when you have an image or can even draw out an image. You can import that image into SketchUp, scale it up how you want it, and then literally just trace around it with a line in the arc tool to give you a component that you can then turn into a full-size template. And you can print it out, glue onto your plywood, and saw it out. <laughs> Plus the real beauty of making your own pattern is I've been able to make it a little bit slimmer, taper the ends a little bit more. I'm going to make the sides a bit thicker than what I've seen around the internet, but just, I don't know, a little bit more elegant shape than just kind of a thick, clunky, rounded over edge. Of course, I'll make the PDF of this pattern available and you can download it from the website. So here's a model that I mocked up. And right off the bat, you can see it's, it's certainly a lot more delicate looking than some of the stuff you find online, like uh, some of the wood magazine plans or wood shops plans that I've seen. The other thing is the slats are spaced closer together. There is a gap there to allow drainage, but only about an eighth of an inch gap. So water runoff won't be quite as much. If you plan to just leave it out on a dock somewhere, you're probably gonna put a little bit wider slat there. I'm also gonna make the slats from hardwood. I'm actually gonna use teak because I have some thin stuff lying around. So these slats are only three eighths of an inch thick, which really changes the overall look of things. I'm gonna paint these curved parts, I'm just calling them the legs, and because of that, I'm gonna be able to use just two by construction lumber, and that'll save me on some planing because it'll already be one and a half inches thick. That little extra thickness will again provide a little bit more support for the thinner slats. The challenge, of course, is, I mean, this is just screwed in place, so there's just boring holes and driving screws, but the challenge lies in these curved legs and shaping them not only to be, have a nice refined curve, but to be identical from one side to the other. If they're not identical, you're gonna have trouble getting the slats to lie flat. Now, one other detail that I'm changing, and I'm probably over-engineering this, but this slat here, this one here, and this one right here, these are the locking slats. They have a bevel on them. You can see there's a bevel right there, and a bevel right there, and right there. Um, that bevel actually sets, those bevels I should say, set the angle of repose here. Most of the original plans you see just have them screwed right in place. So I'm gonna use 3 8 inch thick for the slats here, and a half inch thick for the slats here, and then recess them and little eighth inch dados. And you can see it's drawn in the back right there. Now that poses a fun challenge because one side of the dado is, is 90 degrees, the other side is at an angle. That'll be fun. That'll just pose a, an, another fun little challenge, but I also think it'll make the whole thing just a little bit sturdier. So it's not just a screw we're relying upon to hold everything together. In the end, it's a relatively simple construction, won't use a whole lot of stock, and should be a lot of fun and pretty quick to build. There's not really a lot of tools needed for this build either, so it, it suits my main shop nicely. For milling the parts, a handsaw and a jack plane are all you're gonna need, and I've already got those up in my main shop. Certainly a screwdriver I've got up there, um, and a drill, I've got an egg beater drill up there. So I'm gonna bring along this um, tapered bit, uh, countersink and depth stop dealy whacker. I've actually got two of them to bring along to drill all the holes got a bevel gauge that I'm gonna need for setting the bevels and the interlocking slats. The real work on this is gonna be the curve. So I'm bringing along my turning saw and just popped it apart, uh, brought along three blades because, well, they break. Spoke shave is gonna be used to shape those curves. But the real fun part of this with the long flowing curves that we have, I'm gonna bring my compass plane. This guy really, for this type of curve on one and a half inch uh, thick stock, and the, the shallow radius to it, this guy is just fantastic. 
The spoke shape is fantastic for sculpting and shaping, and I will probably still use it as kind of a rough removal tool straight off the saw. But this can actually refine and set the curve and make the curves identical from one to another because it's got the long sole. So this is one specialty tool that I'm bringing along with me. Don't forget the patterns and don't forget hardware. I'm gonna be using silicon bronze boat builder screws, number eight screws, one and a quarter inch long. You're gonna need about 28 of these, but you know, just pick up a couple of packs. You're probably gonna to wanna to have a few extra. Stainless steel screws will work. You could use brass screws if you want. You also could plug your holes. I actually kinda of like the look of the exposed hardware, especially these cool bronze screws. But if you are uh, inclined to plug the holes, first of all, make sure you have a plug cutter, make sure you have some extra face grain stock that matches your slats to plug those holes. The one caveat I will say is my slats, I'm going with 3 eighths of an inch thick. I really like that thinner look. And by the time I've countersunk that hole, there's not much room left for a plug. So if you are going to use plugs, you probably want to make your slat stock thicker so that you're not boring so deep that there's just not enough meat left in the slat for the screw to hold on to. That's it. I think I got everything. See you guys in Maine. I'm going to trace my patterns onto my 2 by material. I've got the shorter leg here, and it doesn't really matter whether you're using the longer leg or the shorter leg. What you want to focus on is the junction between the two, uh, the two legs, where it's going to lock together. And I want to locate the straightest grain material there. No matter what I do, there's going to be a little bit of grain run out, but the curvature is not so much that you have to worry too much about that. I'm going to get pretty consistent grain using uh, a 2 by 8 for this. Really what I want to focus on is this kind of middle section of the pattern should run through as straight a grain as possible. Now in addition to the two my material for the legs, I've got slat material. And as I mentioned before, if you use a good hardwood, you can get away with some thinner stuff. I went ahead and had some teak in my shop at home and just quickly planed it down to 3 eighths of an inch thickness. Now it's just planed on two faces. I still have the two edges that are rough. And some of these boards I had to rip into approximately 3 inches. Start with about 3 inches wide. We'll end up tweaking the overall width of these boards as we fit them to the legs. I'm going to need a total of 14 slats, but really I've got 11 slats here that are 3 eighths of an inch thickness. And I brought an additional piece of teak here that is at three quarters of an inch. I'm going to rip this into three different pieces and mill it down to a half an inch. And this will actually form the three slats, the interlocking slats that hold the two leg pieces together. So I'll take my piece and hold fast it to the front apron. And using my turning saw, I'm going to start by cutting on the concave arc. Turning saws work best when you use a full length stroke. You've got 12 inches of blade here, so use all the teeth. You even want to take kind of a slower stroke, consciously slow yourself down. Certainly you can go fast, but you want to continue to make full length strokes. But if you've got a more radical curve, this is a pretty gentle curve, a slower, more controlled stroke like this will allow you to follow the line better, making tiny little adjustments as you go and steering that saw. Short strokes tends to be what our default is when we're navigating around curves. A short stroke only uses a very small bit of the blade. More importantly, it doesn't allow the sawdust to clear, so the saw doesn't cut as fast and it heats up. And with a thin blade like this, that excess heat will cause it to snap. Now something like a coping saw would work here, but it would be much, much slower with the shorter throat and the, the shorter blade. Frankly, the best tool for this particular job would be like an 18 or 24 inch frame saw with a 3 8 inch wide blade. This curve is not so sharp that I need this really tiny 8 inch blade. A 3 8 inch wide blade could have deeper gullets and a more aggressive pitch that would cut much better through this 1.5 inch construction number. <laughs> Thank <laughs> you.
Now with the inside sawn out, I will leave the other side unsawn because I can flip it up and it gives me a good base to stand on to come in and refine the inside curve. Now this is something that you can do with a spoke shave. I always start on the edges and take my edges right down to my line, kind of creating a chamfer. I'll do the same thing on both sides. And then you come back and remove the spot in the middle. And of course keep a square handy and just continue to work it until you even the whole thing out. So spoke shape works fine here. You could use something like a draw knife, but this project is tailor-made for a compass plane. Compass plane has an adjustable sole that as you move this, adjust this screw, it can change the sole from convex to concave. Now to set this, you don't want to just automatically set it to the curve that you're trying to go for. You actually want to set it a bit tighter, the radius tighter than the curve you're shooting for. Now at this rough stage, I'm just going to set it approximately. Once you get kind of the initial lumps out of the way, it's certainly a lot easier to use. This plane is not meant to be taking super, super heavy shavings. The mouth is pretty tight on it. So if you have a lot of material to remove, it's probably something where a draw knife or a spoke shave is the best place to start. But I've sawn pretty close to my lines here, so I can get into a pretty constant shape pretty quickly with this compass plane. Now just like a shave or a draw knife or anything, this tool is meant to work downhill but not back up the other side because what you're going to do is tear out as you're working dramatically against the grain on the uphill. Now just make sure you stop and check your, your lines, check your square. To deal with the other curve, I need to flip it around and continue to work downhill. pretty great. Right to my line. A little high on this side. Nice and square, got a great consistent curve from end to end. Now I can saw this other side out. With this inside curve refined, you can see I can flip it over and because I've got two points of contact, it'll be easier to come back and use the compass plane on the convex curve, which is why I saw the inside curve first. For right here at the ends, this is definitely spoke shave work. Now repeat the same process on the outside curve. First sawing, then refining the curve back to the line with a spoke shave or compass plane. Now I'm going to turn my attention to the interlocking slats. Again, I've got a piece of teak here that is, right now it's about three quarters of an inch thick. It's band sawed. One particular thing, you'll look, this has a pretty significant cut to it. One of the fastest ways to flatten a board is actually with a saw. I need three inch wide slats here. When I saw out a three inch wide slat, I'm going to pretty much eliminate all of that cup. So don't get too caught up in milling boards and getting them perfectly flat when sometimes all you need is a saw. Thank you. 
with my three locking slats milled down to a half inch thick and one edge flat and square, I need to bevel the other edge. Two of the slats have um, a 25, 27 degree bevel on one end and the other one has an 11 degree bevel. The reason I'm kind of iffy on the numbers is really you're just gonna use the template and the angles that have been drawn across and set your bevel gauge approximately to that angle and plane that into the board. Now to put the bevel into this edge, don't overthink this. It's really creating an angle that you think is close at first. I'm just chamfering this board. Then I'm going to come in and measure and dang if that's not pretty close already. But I can clearly see I'm a little high on the point. Pretty close, I'm a little high on the heel now. So what I'm gonna do is skew my plane towards the heel. And that's got it. Let me take just a couple passes right down the middle. And we've got the bevel set. That's all it takes. There's no even laying out or marking anything. I'm going to shoot my interlocking slats to a final length of 23 and a half inches. I'll just put a little chamfer on the end. Now to lay out these dados, I've just taken my pattern, laid it over top, and traced around it. You could even go so far as to actually cut out the dados on the pattern. The problem there is then you are set with a specific width for your slats. And if you're just milling up whatever you have, these slats don't have to be three inches wide. They could be one inch wide. They could be, you know, whatever dimension you have. The key, however, is this line, this first angled line. So what you can do is actually lay that line out, square it across, and then bring your slat to bear. Put it in the orientation that you want it. And again, you want to mark the bevel on the front there and then just come in and trace the back side. And this ends up being my waist, traced directly from the piece that's gonna go there. Transfer my lines across, so this is all waist, and I even traced on the opposite face, so I've got it laid out there as well. You wanna repeat that, the short leg, the, the seat leg, has a slat on the convex face, and the long legs, have a slat on both, both faces. The last thing is, is you'll see a depth line here. Again, these interlocking slats are actually thicker than my 3 8 inch thick uh, seat slats. So what I've done is just set my marking gauge to take up that difference and create a dado that will set the piece in and what's left is the same set thickness as this seat slat, the 3 eighths of an inch. So again, the depth of this data is variable dependent upon the thickness differential between the interlocking slats and the regular seat slats. Just saw that straight in down to my gauge line. And then I'm going to drop a couple of relief cuts in the middle here. Now I'll come back and chisel this waist out, just working about halfway down and working back to my gauge line.
flip it over. Now the distance from the outside of one leg to the outside of another leg is 22 inches. With my slats being 23 and a half inches, that means I've got a three quarter inch overhang on the end of each slat. Then I need to line up my leg stock, mark that thickness. So this now, these lines now perfectly match my leg. Now to locate the slat and more importantly the overhang on the, the seat legs, because remember when it folds flat it nests inside the other. So I've got the outer legs clamped together and what I can do is line up these interlocking slats so the ends are flush. And I'll come underneath and mark the slat. And that now gives me the position of the inside of the legs and it just is a matter of transferring the thickness to create the outer wall. Now I know exactly how much overhang I need on the inner legs. Now I need to take all of my slats and shoot the ends chamfer the ends and then setting them from the interlocking slats or just getting one slat to final size and setting them all to length, sewing them all to length. Shooting that end. And applying the chamfer to the faces. And work your way through the remaining slats. You should have 11 of them total. To install the slats, I want to start with the first interlocking seat slat. I've created this little quarter inch template that I can slide into place, butt the slat up against it, bore the holes, and screw everything in. So I've got this slat, everything lined up and clamped in place, and I've got a countersink bit on here. And I'm using number eight, one and a quarter inch silicon bronze screws. And I will add slats all the way out to the very last one. Last slat is going to be a little bit proud of the surface and I'm gonna to want to round over that front edge. Moving on to the back, I've taken another slat and essentially pushed it right up against the seat slat. Now, I do have to fit this a little bit, so I came in and beveled the edge back so that it matches this angle a little bit better. It's not necessary, but it gives you kind of a, a cleaner look to the whole thing. So let's give it a test here. Nestles together nicely. Looks great. Oh, that's the stuff. Now it could be that I've just been on my feet all day and I'm tired, but man, this is comfortable. The curves are, are perfect. It really hugs your back. Oh, I may just sit here for the rest of the night. Nope.
a few finishing touches here. So I can just tell with the, the initial test seating, if you will, really, really comfortable. The curve is great, but as you stand up and sit down and put your hands on it, the, the sharp arises of each one of these slats definitely needs to be broken. I wouldn't go so far as to chamfer around them over, just a slight breaking of the edge so you don't get that sharp line. Um, I'm going to want to kind of round the corners on the top, round the corners on the bottom, put a heavier round over on the front edge here and the front edge here, for that matter, the back and the front edge. So as you pick it up, the whole thing is nice and smooth. You could cut a handle in here if you want to lift it up, but I think I'm going to leave it as is. You could apply your own kind of design uh, embellishments on this by maybe rounding over, putting a curve in the top rail, the bottom rail. It's really up to you. I think I'm just going to leave it and just kind of round those corners and break the edges. Well, the chair has spent the night up on the deck and um, Everyone in the family has sat in it for long periods of time. In fact, I even edited parts of this video in this chair. So I've got some, some good feedback on the areas I need to ease, uh, sharp corners I need to take off. But the most important feedback I got was do not paint it. We love the contrast of the lighter spruce with the teak. So that changes my plan a little bit. Uh, I just use cheap construction lumber for the legs thinking, you know, who cares about knots and things like that. I'm ending up painting it. So, you know, it, it's fine quality spruce. It's a little bit stringy, but I do need to come back and do some cleanup, remove some of the, uh, the, the stamps, the grade stamps, and clean up a bit of the tear out here and there, just so that I can get, you know, a, a, an oil finish ready surface. I'm gonna come back and smooth plane everything, round over all the edges. But one of the things is each one of these slats has been independently drilled. The holes are pretty close to lined up, but they are lined up per slat. So as you take it apart, make sure you number the slat locations so that you can put it all back together using the exact slats. <laughs> Key point, I got this halfway apart before I realized, oh crap, I gotta make sure I can put the whole thing back together. For the finish, I'm actually going to use teak oil. Um, I happen to have teak slats. You could use Danish oil, you could use walnut oil, you could use boiled linseed oil. For an outdoor finish, I just prefer a clear penetrating oil. I do not like film finishes like varnishes, polyurethanes, etc., because that film, it will, the water will get under it. No matter what you do, water will win and it will flake off and you're just gonna have to strip that off and reapply it later. With an oil finish, I just have to maybe give it a light sanding and apply oil every year if I want or not. In the end, both the teak and the spruce are just gonna go gray with UV exposure. Eventually you will need to sand it to get the original color back. But seeing as what I eventually want is this to go gray, I'm not really terribly worried about it. In fact, because I use teak and spruce, it's not the best outdoor, outdoor wood, but it's highly resinous wood. It can be a good outdoor wood. You could just leave it entirely unfinished. A little bit of extra discussion, it was decided that getting it to weather to a nice gray fast was the, the most desired uh, effect. So I'm gonna leave it without finish, which is, hey, less work for me. Now, one thing I should add, because the interlocking slats have been dated into the legs, you will have to do a little bit of finessing on the back side of the slat in order to get it to slide together um, as a unit. It's not that big of a deal, just a little bit of spoke shave work and everything will slide together. Now, because it's decided that there's no finish, that gives me the rest of the evening to enjoy the fruits of my labor, ah, enjoy the sunset, and a comic book. <laughs>